Let me welcome in the president of Clico Policy Holders Group. He is Mr. Peter Pumel. Good morning to you, sir. How are you? Uh, good morning to you, Rennie, and good morning to all your listeners. It was a good victory um, uh, seen through your eyes and, 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 the, and the shareholders, your eyes as president of the Policy Holders Group and the shareholders. Uh, but the government said they are going to appeal the judge's ruling. What does this mean for shareholders and the assets in question? Well, this is early days still. I mean, uh, it is the right of the state to appeal any decision of the High Court uh, as, they, as they see fit, and, and they have exercised that right. Uh, what happens from now is that the, uh, that matter is going to be heard on Tuesday, I think at 10.30, in the forenoon, as they say, in the courts. <laughs> it is going to be heard at 10.30 in the forenoon, which is in the morning, for mm-hmm. the benefit of your listeners. And um, that is going to be heard before Justice uh, Peter J- Rajkumar, uh, Justice Andre Devines and Justice Charmaine Pemberton. Uh, what this means is that it, what this means is that in the event that the government were to prevail in terms of they were successful in their appeal, then another appeal will be filed by the shareholders mm. to contest that appeal, which will go to the Privy Council. Uh, if 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 the, if the shareholders are, uh, are fortunate and the court, court of appeals upholds the judgment of the Honorable uh, the Leonard Judge um, J- Justice Kevin Ramcharan, then I'm sure the state is going to appeal the matter, and it goes up to the Privy Council. So, so win, lose, or draw, this matter looks like it's heading for the Privy Council. It's going to be for a little while. You see, if, in fact, the Court of Appeal does not side with the government, mm-hmm. um, that I'm sorry, if they do side with the government, then the policyholders and shareholders, the shareholders will, in fact, appeal that. Absolutely, and then they will ask for leave to go to the Privy Council. Absolutely, and if 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 um, we have the shareholders prevailing, yes, what you anticipate will happen at that point? Well, given the actions of the government at this up to this point, I I, I suspect or I, I suspect that they will in fact go to the want to go to the Privy Council ask for leave. This is so, going to be a long time. While this is going on, Peter Purmel, yes. what happens with the assets? The status quo. It, it is status quo during this period. Am I correct? Right, sure. But just before I get to that, um, as you know, there's a meeting also Cardiff for that same day, Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. And that is the shareholders meeting, which was requisitioned by the shareholders, and the board has agreed to hold that meeting. That, that meeting is going to be scheduled for, for 3.30. Now, that, what that meeting is, is the, the, um, the resolution that is supposed to be part of that meeting is to elect two additional directors to the board of CL Financial, mm. which means that the balance of power will change. These two directors are going to replace the government? Uh, no, no, not replace. Not They're going to be an addition to the an existing, addition. so the four government directors will remain there. Remember, I just see. remember, there's a board of seven directors, mm. and there's a managing director who, uh, who they purport to have oust as, as, a, as a managing director, but they're also purporting to oust him as a director. So in truth and in fact, there are really about eight directors on the board of mm. um, CL Financial. So if the, if if that those resolutions are passed, which more than likely they will be, given the composition of the, the shareholding, um, it means that the the the, the direct the, the government appointed directors will be in the minority, mm-hmm. and the shareholders would have their elected representatives in the majority, and therefore the balance of power would, would have shifted. Now all of this is predicated on whether or not the government challenges that the, the holding of that meeting on. Um, on, on Tuesday afternoon, mm-hmm. uh, but there are very little grounds, as far as I see, for them to challenge that. This is a this is the, the shareholders in, are entitled by virtue of Section 133 of the Companies Act to call such a meeting, or requisition such a meeting, and the the, the company is obliged to hold such a meeting, so that uh, it would be interesting to see if they challenge the holding of that meeting, because really and it's two separate issues, although they they mm-hmm. may appear to be linked. So if we come back now to the provisional, uh, the appointment of the provisional liquidator. Now their plan is to have, once that provisional liquidator is appointed, then the directors become defunct. They no longer have a function. They can no longer operate as directors. They Mm -hmm. have no longer any power over the assets of the company. Mm -hmm. So that is their strategy to try to scuttle that meeting. Uh, But so far they have lost wrong one, as you know, and they're going to wrong two before the Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. But what is important is that the test, for the appointment of a provisional liquidator. I don't think they have met that test. And they certainly the judge at the level of the high court, or the judge of first instance, as they say in, in the legal jargon, he disagreed with them that they met that, that standard or that test. And let me just explain what that test is. They, for the, to get a provisional liquidator appointed, you have to first show that, it, that you are likely to get the winding order, winding up order that they, are, they petitioned the court for. Mm-hmm. You have to prove mm-hmm. that you will get it. 
but they, 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 you, have proved, you have to prove that you are likely to get it. Uh, and, and there are a whole set of arguments that they, they would have advanced in that regard. So let us assume that they met that first test, that they're probably likely to get a winding up order. The second test is really the more important test, in my view. And, and the, the, that test says that the, gu- the judge must determine whether it is proper or appropriate to issue the winding up order. And once you get into that realm, you're talking, the judge would have disc- a certain level of discretion mm. in the matter. And his discretion would be exercised on the basis of the circumstances surrounding which the winding up order is being requested. Because it, it, it is no secret that CL Financial was insolvent. They, they were insolvent in 2009, mm-hmm. hence the intervention of the government. So the argument that the government is putting forward is that they are still insolvent. Well, da, as, I, as my daughter would say, we know that already. The, the, the whole idea was that the government-appointed directors were supposed to get in there and try to turn around the fortunes of the company with a view to paying back the government. So that argument really is, is, is of no moment as far as anybody is concerned. What is, a, was a, what, is, what is important is what are the circumstances that exist at present that would cause a government or cause the state to want to wind up the company. And as we know, the companies, the, the assets have appreciated in value. The company is in a much better place. They may not be, um, so, sorry, they, they may not be t- fully solvent as a standalone. And, and, and just to explain this, in other words, CL Financial is the holding company uh, or, uh, uh, of the conglomerate. So they hold all the assets of the subsidiary companies, the companies like Angostura, um, Republic Bank, they, they own a substantial share of the Republic Bank. Uh, and, um, and, and CL World Brands, and the list goes on and on and on. But the point is that they're attempting to wind up the holding company on the basis of the balance sheet of the holding company, mm-hmm. not on the basis of the consolidated balance sheet. But they are coming to the court to talk about the consolidated debts of the company. So the debts of Clico are being thrown in there, debts of CIB, the debts of, um, I think, Angostura is owed money too. So they, 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 coming to, so they, they are comparing apples with oranges. They're saying... You owe us X amount of dollars, but we only want to consider Y amount of assets in determining your solvency. We will wait, uh, Peter Permel, who is my guest, the president of the Clico Policyholders Group. Yeah. We'll wait uh, for the court to decide on that. That is the view. I mean, that is your view. The government has a, a contrary view. One of the areas that is contrary here that sure. I think um, is, is on my breakfast table here this sure. morning, my brunch table, yeah. is the question of conflict of interest. Should there be any concern about the conflict of interest with John Jerome being one of the senior counsels on the CL financial issue? I mean, it it has been reported that he would have been privy to world government information with respect to the intervention into CL Financial. And in the, his capacity as Attorney General at the time, he would have instructed that legal action be commenced against CL Financial. Uh, that is the chairman. He would have instructed that action be taken against the chairman, Lawrence Dupre, on behalf of the state. Make clear to us the principles of conflict of interest. And I'm talking about the conflict of interest of, um, of, uh, of Mr. Jerome. Right, it's, and, and it's, his name is John Jeremy, not Gen- Jeremy. Jeremy, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, he's senior mm-hmm. counsel, and mm-hmm. he's acting for one group of shareholders, and I, I think the public may not be aware of those that level of detail. The, people, the, 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 the persons who are before the court are two groups of shareholders, one group uh, which, is, which has uh, Dalco um, Trust, which is, which is the trust that Mr. Dupree is associated with, and that, is being, that, that group of shareholders is being represented by Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Murad, senior counsel. And the other group comprises the other shareholders other than the government, because the government owns 14% of CL Financial. So they are not part of any of those two groups. But the, all the other shareholders other than the Dalco Trust and, the, and, and, and Mr. Dupre, the shares that he holds in his own right and so on, that group is the one that is represented by Mr. John Jeremy. Now, in terms of conflict of interest, clearly uh, from where I sit, I, I don't see a conflict of interest because it's not like, as if he's representing Mr. Dupre or the Dupre Trust, or the, 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 sorry, the Dalco Trust. He is representing the other shareholders who had nothing to do with the collapse of Clico. You have to remember that the people who would have been involved or had or, or the controlling minds at the time when the Clico and CL Financial collapsed would have been the directors on the board, of which Mr. Dupre was the executive chairman of both CL Financial and the executive chairman of Clico. And therefore, that is why I suspect um, action would have been taken. Civil action, I may add, not criminal um, action. Civil action would have been taken against him to sue him for the loss. Because at the end of the day, he would ultimately be responsible. The head of the organization has to, um, has to take responsibility for whatever transpired in his company. 
so that they would have taken action against him. I suppose they would have had other information that the public doesn't have at this point in time. You know, what, you, you know what I'm hard-pressed to follow sure. here, uh, Peter Permel, sure. president of Clegal Policy Holders Group. I understand sure. the point you're making, that sure. we're talking about civil and criminal, we're talking about two separate issues. Here, yes. here is my problem. Yeah, sure. It is all part of the same pie. And if council, mm -hmm. if council must or would or mm -hmm. meet with yeah. Um, uh, but fellow council that represents, you know, part of the shareholders mm -hmm. and the and 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 and, and, and mm -hmm. the policyholders. I mean, right. I cannot see why it is such a stretch mm -hmm. to see that it is at least from the from the, the viewing it, it mm -hmm. seems improper. Well, perception is 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 a is a reality of life. But in in the court in a court, perception doesn't play doesn't play a role. It has to deal with the facts and deal with the law. Not legal, but ethical. Then is what we're looking at. Well, no, there's no issue of ethics here because he's not representing Mr. Dupre or the Dupre Trust. He's representing other shareholders who are entitled by virtue of the Constitution. Remember, this is not Venezuela. This is not um, the Soviet Union. This is not Cuba. People are entitled, based on our Constitution, to representation of their choice. And, and he, as an attorney, a practicing attorney mm -hmm. at law, is entitled to represent whichever client he chooses as long as the issue of that conflict of interest does not arise. I, 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 I'm, I'm still lost because it's mm -hmm. less than 10 years mm -hmm. you, are, you, were the, you were the legal mouthpiece, the advisor of the government. You were the attorney general. Yes, but and now, not with respect to these clients that he's representing. He's, he's, he was the legal mouthpiece with respect to taking civil action against Mr. Dupre. Uh, who is the head? Who is the head of the company in question? Yes, but you have to. You see, people have to understand. There's a big distinction between the directors of a company. It just happens that Mr. Dupre is also a shareholder, but the the action is not being taken in his capacity as a shareholder. It is being taken in his capacity as the executive chairman of Clico and CL Financial, and therefore all the other shareholders who played no role whatsoever in the collapse or the demise of Clico and CL Financial. They cannot be deprived of the opportunity to have representation of their choice. That is, is their it, constitutional right. Is it not also true to say that it just happens to be that in 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 making any judgment or giving any advice against the head of the company, yes. he would be privy to all the facts involved with it, and now sit with that wealth of information, and it becomes a problem when he, albeit, but when he decides to to to, 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 to represent one body in, in in this group of this bigger picture. Well, it is the same pie. Is that information should be available to the public, Rennie. That's the irony of this. All that information that they have should be available to the public, and that's the point we have been making. Why has this issue been shrouded in secrecy? The public has a right to know. If this was the United States, they would have had congressional hearings, as you would know. I mean, you spent some time up there, um, Rennie, and you have to bear it out. You have to, you have to bear your soul in, in, in the public domain, unless it is a matter of national security, where they will probably have here the matter in, 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 I mean, cameras, they say, behind closed doors. This is not any, this should be uh, information that the public should be aware of. So but Peter, in the mm -hmm. 23 years I spent there, there would be the same outrage. Mm -hmm. Folks looking at what clearly mm -hmm. uh, seem here to be, uh, seem to be, like I said, legally it may not be there. But it, there is a problem with this. If you are, in fact, mm -hmm. the attorney general yeah. of, of a country, you represent the government, yeah. and you go after the principle of an organization, and then nine, eight to nine years later, you are, in fact, embroiled in the same, in the same, um, apropos, the same uh -huh. pie, the same contention of the same company, then it is a problem. No, the, the issues are different, and that's, that's the point people must, that people, and that is why there's a court of law, and that's why there are judges, and that's why they deal with the law and they deal with the facts. I understand the point you're making about perception, but if we were to run our country on the basis of perception, you know, a lot of things that are happening will, 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 be, happy, will be worse, will yeah. be worse off, you know, so yeah, you have to true. go with what, what, what the law says what the requirements of the law is. And as, as far as I'm... And I, I mean, this is going to play itself out. I mean, he, I think the governor said they are going to the um, law association. They're going to file yes. some sort of action, mm -hmm. uh, complaint, I should say, against Mr. Jeremy. And obviously, he's going to have to defend himself. Uh, I, I hold no brief for Mr. Jeremy. I'm just saying from the, on the basis of the fact that I'm intimately involved with the issue in terms of hearing all the arguments, reading all the documentation, and so on. He, he, is not, he is not representing Mr. Dupree in any way, shape, or form. He's representing the other shareholders who are not involved in the demise or the collapse of the company. And that, that is really where, where it stands. And that's why I think Mr. Ramesh Lawrence Mavaj, who I think has come out openly and defended his colleague and said that um, he, he, there, there's nothing to worry about. He doesn't have anything to worry about. And Mr. I think Mr. Jeremy, I think his words were, bring it on. You said, it, yes. Yeah, bring I, it on. You, you know? said, so Mr. Mavaj. very confident. 
that, that, that nothing is going to come out of that. This is going to amount to a hill of beans, as they say. Mr. Mirage, the colleague, you did say, of Mr. Jeremy. Colleague in law. I, I Remember just, these guys refer to one another as my, 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 my brother, my brother, my, my colleague in law. Not necessarily his colleague as part of a company. I know, I just wanted to get that. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Peter Promel, my guest, president of Clego Policy Holders Group. Uh, in the winding down moments we have here, I do want to ask of you this. Uh, $15 billion, yes. it is said, uh, is still owed to the government. The argument is that for a $40-plus billion company, you want yes. to uh, sell it off in what you call a fire sale for $15 billion. Um, and my query to you the last time you were here, which was last week, is that how much of that money can I immediately get you said you can give me 13 billion and then i must wait for um, an arrangement to be made for the collection of the final two billion dollars that is assuming that we are all agreed on the issue of 23 billion dollar being the final debt is that correct right well and, and i'm glad you said if we all agreed and that is obviously in contention what is actually owed because what the government when remember they said it was 20 billion then it went to 23 billion then it went to 27 billion they have gone to court with some 15 billion. And when I, and I, in fact, I was now reviewing the court documents that were filed by the government, and that's the, the petition. And interestingly, what they are now saying is that of that, well, not they're now saying, at the, 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 at the time of filing this petition, they have acknowledged that about 3 billion of that 15 billion would be advisors' fees. They got back 7.48 billion mm -hmm. from the sale of methanol holdings. And they're also saying that, in truth and in fact, what is really owed is just over $5 billion. When, I, when you look at these documents, and these, these are matters I'm going to speak to. As you know, I, I mentioned to you, I'm going on another program on another station around 12 30 Well, I'm PM. glad for that, but um, yeah. I'm not going to help them out with that conversation <laughs> right now. So just complete your part. Your yeah, yeah, so. Come on, Peter, you know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you mean, I didn't call any news. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so you, but, will, you will continue to make your representation uh, to the public so they can understand this even clearer. Yes, 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 yes. All right, Peter, it. Tuesday morning is going to be what we call, uh, Sparrow would say tonight is the bongo night, yes. but Tuesday morning is going to be the bongo time, yeah, and yeah. we will watch that situation and see what comes about. I, I call it high noon at the OK Corral. High noon at the OK Corral. <laughs> mm, Wild Earp and uh, who was involved yeah, in, in Viva, the... I, I think, it, yeah, um, Viva and Cleef. Uh, uh, oh, you, you're looking at the movie the version, yes, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the movie interpretation. I think it was uh, Wyatt Earp and uh, somebody. Else. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. shall see, and I, I'm not too sure I want to use uh, High Noon as, <laughs> as a good example in this Trinidad and Tobago climate this day. But thank you very much, Peter. You you're have yourself a wonderful day. Have, have a great day now. Thank you so very much.